Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast is brought to you by Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. $38 a month is all it takes to release a child from poverty. We're all looking for ways to make a difference. We're all looking for ways to help. Why not help release a child from poverty? Every child that comes through the Compassion International program is being discipled in the Word of God, and over 150,000 children have chosen to follow Christ in the last year alone. That's what it's all about. $38. I want to personally encourage you to sponsor a child through Compassion, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. The website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. You won't regret it. Today on the podcast, we welcome Clay Martin to the show. Clay is an NFL referee. He's also the varsity boys basketball coach at Jenks High School in Oklahoma. And this is such a unique story here and it's such a unique guest because, first of all, Clay is the first NFL referee that we've had on the podcast. So that's always fun to have a first that you can kind of dive into what his job entails as an NFL referee. But he's also a varsity basketball coach in high school. So he's got a unique perspective here, both as a coach and as a referee. And he played his college ball. He played basketball in college at Oklahoma Baptist University. He originally got recruited to play on a football scholarship at the University of Tulsa before moving to Oklahoma Baptist University and playing basketball. He received honorable mention NAIA All-American honors in 1998 and was a third-team All-American selection in 1999. So he could play some, some basketball. And now he's a coach and a ref. It's such a unique story, an interesting story there. Uh, Clay entered the NFL as an umpire in 2015, and last year, 2018, was his first year as a referee, taken over for Ed Hockley, who had mentored Clay, and uh, Clay now an NFL referee. So let's hear his story. It's got a unique twist to it, and just interesting nuggets, I think, in learning about what it takes to be an NFL referee and kind of what that daily life is like, even in the offseason, and the grind that is an NFL referee schedule. It's just as much a grind as it is to be a player in many ways, to travel every single week. So let's get to Clay Martin, NFL referee, here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. Clay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jason. It's an honor to be here. Ah, It's great to talk to you, Clay. Uh, It's interesting. I think the best way to maybe start this interview is to kind of talk about right now, because we're taping this. It's almost May, uh, just about May. It's the last day of April as we tape this interview so it's the NFL off season from a game playing standpoint, which is where it mostly affects your world. I would I would assume <laughs> being an NFL referee. But what is what is life like right now for an NFL referee? Is it a is it a twelve month job or is there time off where you get to kind of just kind of stay away from it for a few months? Well, you know, there's not a whole lot of time off. I think, you know, I was fortunate to to be mentored by Ed Hockley. I was on his crew and I got hired into the league a few years ago and, and he felt it was important. You know, he's always said, Clay, listen, what my philosophy has been is to take February off. You know, the Super Bowls happen. So we're not, he doesn't open the rule book or, you know, watch video or anything like that. So I've tried to, to mirror that where I let February kind of be kind of a decompressed month. But, you know, uh, being a newer official in the league and especially a newer white hat, uh, I've tried to to not let up too much as there's still so much to learn. So from rule study to, to video work, it, uh, it definitely is a year round thing. So what is that? Is that um, four or five, six hours a day, you know, or a couple hours a day where you're where you're in essence, watching film, you know, talking to other officials, you know, is that a, well, really I, what it's about? Certainly. I, th- I think it changes uh, day to day. There's no set routine. I mean, I still have my other job at school and, and they probably wouldn't like it if I was six hours a day, uh, you know, six <laughs> hours a day on, on their time. But, fair, fair. but certainly you have to, you, you know, you have to make time. It's important. So maybe it means you're getting up earlier or maybe it means you're working, doing some football stuff on your lunch break or, or late at night. And so definitely collaboration with other officials. 
officials, you know, some off-season tests are starting to come out. And so as we're looking at rules and applications, um, but a lot of time in the rule book. Um, again, it's a, it's a complicated rule book in the NFL. And so um, everything we can do to try and become more and more familiar with, with that and more well-versed. And so, uh, you know, replay, casebook plays, all those things like that. So um, I wouldn't quite say it's six hours a day right now, but uh, we definitely we definitely are putting in some time. Is it hard being in a profession where you're expected to get everything right? And when you get it right, you don't hear anything, but you hear all the chirping when there's a play missed <laughs> or called wrong. And I Certainly. just I wonder about that because it's a tough job just because of the scrutiny and the people that are chirping in your ears from coaches, certainly to fans and, and, and probably front office officials and people of that magnitude. Describe what that's like kind of on a day to day, week to week basis, especially during the season. Yeah, you know, it can be, um, you know, it's, it's, you've got to prepare yourself for, for those moments. I can remember getting hired at the division one level and, and a mentor of mine at that level said, you know, it's one of the few professions, if not the only one where you're expected to be perfect and get better. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as, as you just mentioned, you know, silence is kind of golden sometimes, you know, maybe we nail a, a tight call or whatever. Nobody says a word about it because that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, we're supposed to get those right. Um, and then when there's a borderline uh, play that's either, you know, uh, an obvious miss or a tight play that could go either way, people are going to have opinions. And so, you know, for us and in and, uh, and our profession, it's Hopefully, when we see something on the field, it's not the first time we've seen it. We've seen it through video work. We've seen it through other games, and we've put ourselves in a position to to make a good judgment when that play happens. Last year was your first season as an NFL referee, the white hat, as you described it. It's your fourth year overall as an official. How would you assess how that first season went wearing that white hat and maybe comparing the differences in the role of being a referee, for those that may not know, to being uh, what you were prior to that as an official on the side. Sure. You know, it's, it's when we, when you get the call and I was a referee in college for two years. Um, and so you had a little bit to, to base it on, but being a referee in the NFL is, is a completely different thing. And, um, I tell you, it's, you know, um, Al River on our boss, our supervisor of officials, you know, when he called to say, listen, Hey, congratulations, this is what we want to do. You know, one of the first thing he t he'll tell you is, you know, you, this isn't just a referee. You're the, you know, the crew psychologist, the crew psychiatrist, the crew marital counselor, the crew doctor, the crew this, the crew that, because mm -hmm. you are considered the crew chief. And so, you know, as an umpire came into the league as an umpire, and and obviously you're working and you're trying to be diligent in the things that that you need to do, but. You know, now that responsibility kind of, it, it's for all nine of us, our seven on-field officials and two replay guys that are on our crew. And it's just trying to be a manager of everybody and an encourager, a supporter. Um, and so uh, kind of the voice of the crew, obviously, if there's communication with New York or anything like that, it, it typically goes through me. So for me, it was just, okay, how do I uh, develop these relationships to, you know, be that crew psychologist or be that crew psychiatrist, you know, the old John Wooden quote, you know, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care yeah. really means a lot in this role. Uh, and so, you know, you've just got to establish those relationships. And, and uh, so when it is time to play those different roles, uh, you know, you're well versed to do so. And in the same way, those guys play the same role for me. You know, they know when, when they've got to help me get up and so forth. So uh, it's truly about relationships. Now it's just not about me getting better individually it's about how do we get all nine of us better describe your schedule during a season you know the nfl <laughs> uh you know teams sure. put a game plan in prior to every game that they play right is officiating Certainly. kind of the same thing I think so. I mean, you know, routine is huge and, um, you know, the weeks just fly by, you know, once middle of July gets here, they just seem to fly by. And, and, you know, for me, I guess I'll kind of work backwards. I think the best way to describe it is, is when I leave a stadium, um, you know, we leave the stadium and go right to the airport, uh, you know, 90% of the time, unless you're doing a, a night game or something, or you can't get home. But, you know, I get on that plane and I put my thumb drive in and we, and I start evaluating, um, looking at, looking at the game that our crew just worked and making notes and, 
and, you know, working on things to incorporate for next week's pregame. So by the time I land at home, I, I hope to have watched our game once or, or twice, depending on the length of the flight, and have made notes that I want to look at. Um, I have to have a game report in by Monday at a certain time of the day. Uh, about our game and our calls or maybe calls we didn't make and things like that. Uh, I'm constantly, it's every day is a work in progress for the next week's pregame. Maybe it's a new memo. Maybe it's a new uh, interpretation. Maybe there's some video I think that could be useful. So always working on the PowerPoint or whatever I'm going to incorporate for next Saturday's pregame. Um, you know, Tuesday we start getting uh, remarks from the evaluator of, of that game. And so I'm in communication with, with that individual on, on you know, again, just his remarks of the game and, and calls and different things, um, preparing video tests for our crew. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, pregame Wednesday final grades come out. And so now I'm talking with the crew about certain things that happened in the game, praising them, obviously. What are things we need to get better? Uh, sometimes that involves communication with New York. And then uh, Thursday, I try to finish up our pregame uh, for our meeting on Saturday and uh, get all that ready to go. Uh, Friday's a test day. We start getting tests from the league office and things that need to be done before we get there Saturday. Saturday, board a plane and uh, fly to wherever. And uh, we meet that day typically for about three hours. And, and as we've all been, you know, I've assigned different responsibilities in preparation for the two teams we're going to have. And uh, so we have about a three-hour pregame. And typically we have a crew meal that night. And then Sunday's just a blur. It's uh, We wake up, we have a crew devotion, breakfast, we leave for the stadium, and uh, then it circles right back around to where I just told you I started the week. So <laughs> it, it really does fly by. And then I'm, you know, and then back to work, Monday, get, usually land in Tulsa around midnight or so, and then, you know, back to my school job uh, Monday morning. Wow. That's, a, that's, that's crazy. I, I wonder, do you know, like in the, say, July, June or July, where you're going to be every week during the season, or is that kind of decided throughout the year? Correct. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's my understanding anyway. In the, in the years before me, maybe even 20 years ago, that that they used to get their whole season's worth of schedule. But you know, we don't get that till much later in the year, and we typically get one game at a time. That's normally about a month out. Okay. Um, and I think you know, so once we start getting assignments every Monday, we'll get the next one. And, um, you know, for example, four weeks before our first preseason game, we'll get that email that says, here's where your crew's going. And, and, uh, we've got to do some things in terms of travel by a certain date. And then the next Monday there's preseason two, which is a month out from that date. And so, you know, about four weeks out is our typical window. And, uh, but it is just one game at a time. Clay Martin is our guest here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. So you work in the world of the NFL, but you're also a high school varsity boys basketball coach and you mentioned working in the school there so what was your first love was it basketball was it football basketball was always my love as a player i played basketball and football and in, in high school and actually went to the university of tulsa on a football scholarship in college before transferring to obu to play basketball and so I've always enjoyed both sports and, and those that have known me the longest just find it funny that I'm still involved with both, you know, a basketball coach, but yet a football official. And, but as a, as an athlete, basketball was always my love. I love to be in the gym. That's where I spent most of my time in terms of self-improvement. And uh, so I've always enjoyed being in the court, being on the court. We always love hearing the testimonies of when God became real to the guests that we have here on the podcast. So love to hear your testimony. Tell us about, when that happened for you and how you your relationship with the Lord evolved and when you made that decision? You know, I, uh, Jason, I, I was very, very fortunate to, to be brought up in the church. Um, you know, I think I came out of the womb at First Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> Essentially, uh, you know, we we've, uh, grew up in that church and we moved to Tulsa when I was about nine months old. My, my dad was a Marine and, and uh, was getting out of the service at that time. And we moved over and as mom was from Oklahoma down in Ada and, uh, but just always in church, Sunday morning, Sunday nights, Wednesdays, RAs, you know, choir, all those type things. And so church was always a part of, of our family's life. And, uh, at an early age, I knew, um, that I wanted to, that I wanted to please Jesus, 
that I, I think I had an understanding that I wanted to spend eternity in heaven with him. And, um, it's, it's, this is kind of bizarre, but when my grandmother passed away, I was only five years old and hmm. I was at an age where my parents said, you know, they did, they didn't let my younger brother and I actually go to the service part of it. They just didn't know if we were old enough. But, you know, back in those days, we had cassette tapes and the church that she had the service in gave us a cassette tape of the service. And I remember listening to it as a, as a young man, or as a young boy, I should say. And one of the old hymns on there was called When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Hmm. And I would listen to my grandmother's service. And I, I remember asking my parents, well, what does that mean? You know, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And and it really began to open conversations about, you know, how to spend eternity in heaven and, and with and with our Lord. And so uh, I was nine years old um, and just told my mom, I said, I don't know everything, but I know I want to be with Jesus. And, uh, you know, we went, uh, we prayed in our kitchen uh, right there at the age of nine uh, with my father, the three of us, and my brother uh, all at the same time. And uh, that Sunday went down and, and met with our pastor and told him what we wanted to do. And and obviously having kind of that childlike faith at the time and, and, you know, knowing simply what I wanted and just having my faith be challenged and, and, and grown, you know, how to grow it over the next, you know, however many years now has just been awesome. And, and, uh, you know, I remember as a sophomore in high school hearing a guy by the name of Brent Price give his testimony. He was a really talented basketball player at the University of Oklahoma under Billy Tubbs. And yeah. and he shared Colossians 3.23 and during his uh, talk that night at the church. And it just, you know, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. And I was about 15 at the time when I heard that. And being a student athlete and hearing him share something like that, I had never heard that verse before. I thought, oh, my gosh, I, I, I think I kind of get this a little bit. And it really just started to challenge me with, you know, what my motives were, not only with my sports, but but as a son, as a, as a sibling, you know, as a worker. And it really just challenged me that all I need to do is just give my best to God. And and uh, that's kind of been almost, I, I think, the verse that has guided me, that in Philippians 2, 2 through 5. But, you know, being fortunate to be brought up in the church was, was phenomenal. But, you know, the Lord really, really became real to me. Uh, and I think I started selling more out to Him with my commitment and time and Scripture and prayer, I think, probably in the middle of my high school years. So as you are growing in your faith here, and you're certainly doing pretty well in sports, and you get a scholarship to go play college football, and then d decide to go play college basketball instead, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell me about any of the adversity that you might have faced. It sounds, you know, the way you described your faith, it sounds like there's never been any moment where you kind of walked away from God or questioned him at all. But adversity comes in all shapes mm -hmm. and sizes for all of us. And it, I, so many of us I even told my daughter this this morning. I said, you know, adversity can either define you or it can refine you. Absolutely. And, I, and she's only 14, so I'm not sure if she totally <laughs> understands what I was trying to say. But <laughs> yes, I wonder sir. for you, Clay, how has adversity defined you and, and refined you over the years in your faith in pursuing sports? Sure. You know, I think, and, and you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we've been very fortunate that, yes, we, we've obviously had our own issues uh, that we've dealt with individually and as a family, but but God has been good. And um, I'm very, very thankful for the fact that when adversity has hit in my life, I've, I've been a little bit more further along in my walk with Jesus. I'm a little bit more mature of a Christian when those challenges hit. I mean, I think back going to the recruiting process you know, the ups and downs of that. And, and God, please, you know, I just, I, I need to hear from you. Where do you want me? You know, and just having to, to let him guide me on what I thought, what he, what I felt that he wanted me to do. And, yeah. you know, I went to the University of Tulsa thinking I was going to be able to do two sports, football and basketball. I was recruited by both. And, and after playing my freshman year, you know, it just, it became apparent that, that, you know, the two sports didn't think it was a good idea and it crushed me. Um, now there are worse things in life than that, you know, that, that you can pat about and woe is me about. But for me, it was just, oh, this, this stinks. I, I really, this is why I was here and, and why this now, Lord. And, and, but what it did do is it opened the door for me to, to transfer, to just play basketball. And, and I went to OBU. I didn't want to have to sit out a year after transferring. And it put me in, in contact with a guy by the name of Bob Hoffman, who was the coach there at the time. And just a tremendous 
tremendous Christian coach and leader. Went on to work for him at Texas Pan American right out of college, and he's just done amazing things in, in his own ministry as a coach. Had great success at Mercer. You may remember when they upset Duke in 2014 and sure. in March Madness. And so Coach Hoff, I started hearing things like servant leadership and leading with humility, um, and it really began to, to pierce my heart. And that's when Philippians 2 just you know, really began to challenge me with, you know, this isn't about just my needs or my selfish ambitions. It's how do I meet the needs of others? And getting to, to play under him and for him and then work for him. You know, had I not gone through that when I left to you, who knows what would have happened? You know, God would have provided, but it would have taken me on this journey to connect with, with Coach Hoffman. Um you know, and so, you know, fast forward to maybe five or six years ago, you know, we, our, our oldest child got sick and really, really sick for a while. We were in the hospital for a month. And, and you know, that, that I think just being honestly, that was maybe the most, gosh, I mean, I, I think in all honesty, angry I felt I've ever been to see our, our daughter dealing with some things and having to go through some things and just wanting to just, uh, you know, lash out at God and, and why my daughter, why not us? And, you know, I remember our pastor, Darren Spoo at First Tulsa, just always challenging us, you know, you're not always going to know the right thing to say to God. And when you don't, he said, I remember, I'll remember it to the day I die. He said, for a long time, just pray short prayers, you know, and, and I would pray things like help. Yeah. And that's all I knew to say and why and, and, you know, doggone it and, and things like that, but never wanting to stray away because I knew more than ever we needed him. But that's, uh, I think that's in my own journey, that's probably the most uh, frustrated, down. I mean, you can just think of the adjective when you have a, a child that's hurting. Yeah. And, but, you know, you get through that and you look back and you're just, what can I learn from this? And God was there with me the whole time. And, and I was so thankful that I just got to be frank and open and real with, with God because there's no way we would have gotten through it without him. Mm. Clay Martin's our guest here on the podcast. When does becoming a referee come into the picture? Because everything that you've described from college, <laughs> you go from football to basketball, you learn under under uh, some great coaches, and then you want to go and pursue coaching even a little bit there. And you're still a coach, a basketball coach mm -hmm. uh, for high school for the boys. and But you're also mm -hmm. an NFL referee, and you were a college football mm -hmm. referee. So where does that come into play? Golly, that's – that's a that's a funny question. I never would have thought in a million years I'd be an official. Um, <laughs> my goal was to be a coach, and right out of right after I graduated OBU, I got to go be a Division One basketball assistant coach with Coach Hoffman down at Pan Am. And everybody thought, "Wow, what a, what a great way to start your career!" Here you are, twenty three, and you're a Division One assistant. And we had a great time, and learning under him was phenomenal. But we always felt, Shan and I did, that, that the high school level was our calling, just serving those kids. And I was impacted greatly in my high school level uh, by coaches and mentors. And, and so when we became, when we decided to get into high school, Shannon, you know, we had our first child by then, our daughter, who I referenced earlier. And, you know, she really wanted to be able to stay at home with her, and which was great. I said, that's great. I'm completely on board with that. It's, it's how do we do it? You know, yeah. how do we do it? You know, it's, it's, I'm a wealthy public school educator in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, that's, that's sarcasm if you're not from <laughs> Oklahoma, but it's how do we make it happen? You know, what do we yeah. do? And I had been approached by some people, but hey, have you ever thought about officiating? And oh, no, I haven't. I'm coaching. And, but I just said, you know what? I'm coaching basketball. I don't want to officiate basketball. I just feel like that would be a conflict of interest. Maybe those guys that I work with may have some of our games. I just didn't think that was appropriate. And so I went to a football meeting at the Greater Tulsa Officials Association. This was in 2005 and went to a first meeting and, and, you know, the rookies had to go around and introduce themselves and, you know, Hey, I'm Clay Martin. And of course I knew probably 80% of the guys in there because a lot of officials at the high school level do every sport. They do a lot of sports. And, and, uh, from that moment just began to develop mentors for me or, or find mentors that helped me along the way. And uh, that year, I was able to work, uh, fortunate enough to get a, a full varsity schedule. I think more so because the officiating shortage is so is so big here. Yeah, uh, we need officials, and you know, work in varsity games and and youth games and junior high games, and 
So I do that for a year, and uh, I, the second year I got asked to be on a crew at the high school level, and I, I was able to, to work for a guy by the name of Don Thomas, who was a long, long time official in our state, and who really had a reputation for you know just making guys better, making officials better, and and it was at the end of that year I got invited to work a spring scrimmage at the University of Tulsa. I had some mentors say, "Man, you're, you've got a feel for this. You've played it. You can move a little bit. Um, you need to start coming to some college scrimmages with us." And so I did, and. It was one spring scrimmage that day that after the scrimmage, this gentleman by the name of Gerald Austin, uh, who is the supervisor of officials for Conference USA, introduced himself and wanted to know why I hadn't applied for Conference USA. He said, you're in our footprint. Uh, and I just said, sir, it is so good to meet you. I, I, you know, He's an NFL referee. I knew exactly who he was. And I said, but I've only been doing this two years. And he said, I don't care. I want your application. And so he saw something in me. And so that next year, my third year of officiating, I was on a Division I football field. Wow. And I uh, got two Division I games that year. I worked four the year after while still doing some high school stuff during those those two years. And then after my uh, second year, so the beginning of my third year in Conference USA, I was put on a crew as a line judge. And um you know, work that for four years, and Gerald moved me to referee, and and he said, I'm gonna, I want to make you a referee because the NFL kind of sees you there one day. And I said, Excuse me. He said, Yeah, they they have really enjoyed Clay. They've been coming to your games and scouting you, and they kind of see you maybe in the referee mold. They've they've seen how you communicate with coaches on your sideline, and and I'm just blown away. I mean, I'm a third or fourth year college official, yeah. and he's telling me the NFL sees this in me. So it was very humbling, and and so he moved me to referee, and uh, did that. And and uh, after my first year as a referee is when I got the call to interview with the NFL, and went up to New York and set through that process and went through it, but did not get the call. You know, I didn't get my name called that year in 2014, and and uh, you know you're kind of down about it, but. You look back and you see why. If if they saw me as a referee one day, then I needed to get some more referee experience at the college level. And uh, so I worked another year, and then uh, in April of 2015, I got the call from Dean Blandino uh, welcoming me into the NFL. And it was just a, a very cool moment, a very surreal moment. And uh, that's when I got the call to join the NFL. That's awesome. I love that. That's a great story, too, because it's really a testimony to – trusting in the Lord's plan. And sometimes it's not our plan, but it's the perfect plan. Absolutely. Right? And he takes you into this place that you kind of never imagined. Did you see that? Mm-hmm. Now that you look back, I always tell people when you look back, you can see God's plan perfectly at hand. You can kind of see that and sense that now that as you look back as well, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, through my, through my years early, you know, when I got into high school coaching, we started having some success and I had some chances to go back with some guys at the division one level as an assistant I got involved with some Division II jobs as the head coach, and I just never felt a peace. And people were like, okay, your, your school's pretty cool. We know Jinx is a neat place, but you know, why aren't you taking these jobs? And we just never felt a peace about it. Shan and I didn't. We'd pray about it, and, and we loved the idea of finding a school that we could be at and raise our kids there and, and you know, just be in the same home and, and, uh, and whatnot. And you know, you look back now, obviously, and you go, okay, now I know why there wasn't peace, because this was God's plan. It wasn't to get back into college coaching. It wasn't to to chase that at all. This is what he had for me. And I never would have dreamed that 20 years ago. But man, it's it's been a heck of a ride. And looking back, you just feel so fortunate and so blessed. Clay, how do you live your faith out as an NFL referee? And even as a coach, too, I think, because people forget mm-hmm. you're coaching high school basketball as well. Mm -hmm. And I know you're in Oklahoma, so maybe there's a Mm -hmm. different view of faith there than there is, say, up here in Connecticut where I live. But how Mm -hmm. does one live their faith out in the workplace in the sense of how you go about your job? Obviously, you can't walk on the field with a Bible in your hand, but tell me about how you go about (laughs) living your faith out as an NFL referee and even as a high school basketball coach. Well, you know, I think with our with our kids here, first of all, at, at the school, um, we we try and utilize 
different scriptures every year, different verses that we may call a team theme or something. Um, Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Mm. You know, we've used Colossians three twenty three. We've used Philippians 2, 2 through 5. We have something different each year to challenge the guys with that, that's out of the Bible, uh, something that I think that the guys will relate to and be encouraged and inspired by. Um, guys, uh, verses that, that can be challenging, uh, to us, you know, um, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, except, you know, that which is, is useful for building a brother up out of, out of Ephesians. And so, yeah. you know, just things that I think that, that mean something to a team. Um, you know, Philippians 2 15, do all things without murmuring and complaining so that you'll be blameless and harmless. Things that I think that can challenge our team and pull us together. And also that may open the door for conversations with, with young men that may not have that background. Uh, for me, the constant challenge is my intensity. Uh, I'm an intense, passionate coach. You know, I've never been a guy that used language, but I never want my intensity or, or passion to cause anybody else to stumble. My interactions with high school basketball referees, I guarantee I'm known as an intense coach that will, that will, you know, question and get on and, and yeah. communicate with. And so, you know, I've really had to work on that um, because they don't know if I'm swearing or not. I, we could be talking about what type of pizza they want after the game, but if I look like I'm intense and in their face, you know, who knows what's being, you know, what, what, what everybody that's seeing that thinks. And so, um, and then I think as an official, I've just tried to apply this team concept to our crew. Um, you know, we're together almost half the year in, in one way or another, um, on different weekends and whatnot. And, and, um, you know, so we do spend time as a crew and devotional every week and, and our crew's even committed to doing that even when it's not a game on Sunday. You know, we may have a Thursday night game, but we still meet on uh, for a certain period of time to talk and pray and just put ourselves, hopefully, you know, we're, we're trying to get vulnerable with each other with needs that we have and things we're dealing with. And so, you know, I think when I'm on the field, I have opportunities um, to show that I can stay calm in heated situations. Uh show a peaceful heart yeah. when things tend to escalate or, 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 you know, I hope, I hope that if I do those things, they make, oh man, what's different about that guy? You know, how, how can he stay calm? How can he do these things when, when the, you know, what's hitting the fan, so to yeah. speak. And so, uh, for me, it's, I really try to, to live out the things I challenge, you know, my team and my kids with. So, and hopefully I do that. Last couple of questions here with Clay Martin on the podcast. Sure. I always like asking this question to people. It's only been recently that I've been asking it more and more, but I'm always curious the answer. What's your what's your definition of success as a as a coach and as a referee, but even as just a man of faith? What is what is Clay Martin's mm-hmm. definition of success? You know, we've always, we talk about that a lot as staff, you know, what is success? What is, you know, and for me, I think just with our teams each year, it's, we have certain goals that we want to achieve every year. That may not mean success, or maybe it does. I think there's a difference between goals and success. And so for us, we really try and define our, it was this season of success is, you know, did we not only meet expectations, but exceed expectations. Mm. And if that means we're 10 and 15, okay, you know, nobody's going to be happy about that. And it's easy to sit here and talk about on a podcast. Yeah, we could be happy with 10 and 15 when, you know, you may not be, but, and thankfully we haven't experienced that very much, but it's, here's what we think our team is capable of. Can we exceed that just a little bit with each young man that comes through our program? Are we challenging him to not only meet but exceed his expectations as a student athlete and as a young man. And if we can do that, we think the wins and losses will take care of themselves. Is that hard, though, even not just as a coach, but in the world of achievement and a world of accomplishment to define success and not look at those things as oh, absolutely. the it's definition hard. of success? I think so. It's hard. I mean, we're a numbers driven society, a data driven society. I think nowadays more than ever, the process to get to where you want to be is sometimes it's almost forgotten. It's, it's, we want to be, we want to be great and we want to be great yesterday. And, you know, I look at my own walk and my own faith and you know what, I've, 
uh, I've grown closer to God, you know, over the last 40 years, you know, not just in 40 seconds or, or four months. And so um, certainly there are expectations and it's sometimes hard, you know, for for those in the program, parents, you know, anybody to say, well, you know, why is this team different than last year's team or why is this year's better than last year's team? And so I think, you know, uh, as we look at our teams with our high school guys, it's, you know, what are we doing each year to make this team its own experience? And are we maximizing the experience with that team? And if we feel like that, that our guys are able to do that, then we feel like it has been a success. And, and fortunately for us, it, it has meant some, some good wins and some good teams and some good experiences. Last question here, Clay, and this has been great having you on the podcast. We always ask this to all of our guests. What is the Lord teaching you right now in the season of life that you're in as a referee, as a coach? What are you learning from God during this season of life? You know, that's such a good question. And I, I think the word trust comes to mind. Um, our oldest child leaves in a couple months for college. Mm. Um, wow. And that's new to us. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's golly, who's going to be there to protect her? How, what is she going to do if something happens, you know? And, and so I think our parenting as parents, it's just the word trust and trusting that, Hey, we've tried to raise her up scripturally and biblically and, and with the Lord's grace and mercy, and she's going to be fine. We've got to trust that. And then also just trusting, you know, this process of officiating that, you know, learned so much last year through good times and some hard times and and just trusting that the Lord does have a plan. And there's a reason he's using this officiating opportunity for me. And I've got to be hopefully I've got to be in tuned with him enough to know that when those opportunities are there, I've got to be able to to, to seize those. He is Clay Martin, an NFL referee and the head varsity boys basketball coach at Jenks High School in Oklahoma. Clay, thanks so much for being a part of the podcast. Really enjoyed talking to you and look forward to uh, following the 2019 NFL season. And hopefully we'll get you back on again soon. Thanks a lot. It is such an honor for me. Thanks for having me. And many thanks to Clay Martin, the NFL referee and the head varsity boys basketball coach at Jenks High School in Oklahoma. Thanks to Clay for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Also want to thank you for listening and subscribing to this podcast. If this is the first time you've ever heard the Sports Spectrum podcast, welcome. We're so glad that you tuned in. You checked us out today. If you could, one thing is really all we're asking is hit that subscribe button. We'd love to have you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any other episodes. We've had over 300 of these episodes so far. The podcast has been out for a couple years now. We've had close to 800,000 downloads of the podcast. So God is doing some great things and we're glad to have you on board. So click that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast. We also want to thank our sponsors, Compassion International. For $38 a month, you can release a child from poverty. Go to the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum, compassion.com slash sports spectrum, food education, medical care, vocational training, all done in Jesus' name. That's what it's about. And it's your chance to sponsor that child through Compassion for $38 a month. Check out the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, and sponsor a child today. Thanks for listening. Give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sports underscore Spectrum. Tweet at us. Send us a note on Facebook or Instagram. Love to hear what you thought of this episode of the podcast. Certainly share it with others. That's how this website and podcast and this brand at Sports Spectrum, that's how it gets out. You know, telling others about what you've seen and what you've heard. If you know someone who loves Jesus and loves sports, please share with them what we're doing here at Sports Spectrum. We're honored to be really just his ambassador, uh, an ambassador of Christ. That's what it's about here at Sports Spectrum. So please tell others about the work that we're doing. It might encourage them just as it has encouraged you. Thanks for listening. We love you. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast.